David, is the tax system fair in this country? Well, no, it's not. Uh, you have a, a very small minority of people who carry the can uh, for just about the whole of the country. Uh, you've got a third of people who pay no income tax. Some of those people get a lot more back from the government than they pay in in taxes. Well, what are uh, so, you talking about there? Well, you've got, according to the IRD, uh, a whole lot of people. So some of them might be people on benefit. Some of them might be people uh, at a stage of life. Some of them might be superannuitants. Um, but the idea that we have an unfair tax system, uh, I think is true, but not in the way a lot of people say. Um, you've got a very small number of people, 23% uh, of people who earn over 70,000 paying about 80% of all taxes. Um, and I don't think that is a, a fair system. I think it's a system uh, that puts a huge amount of pressure on a small number of people to carry the can. And Chloe, I am going to ask you the same question, but I figure I'm going to get a slightly different response. Only slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I think the research has released this week has confirmed what a lot of New Zealanders have suspected for a really long time. That's that our tax system and therefore the way that our economy is set up is fundamentally unfair. It privileges wealth hoarding. And what that means actually is reflected in the IRD and Treasury reports is not only that that is fundamentally unfair in terms of the proportion that people are paying and what they're capable of paying, but also that we end up with pretty counterproductive outcomes in terms of the flow of investment and therefore the flow and effects to productivity. And even more so than that, we're also starving our public infrastructure and services, our healthcare system, our education system, our housing system and our social services. These things can be fixed. It's just a matter of political willpower. David, I wanted to, uh, the sort of headline out of this from the IRD report was that uh, nurses, school teachers, hairdressers, cleaners and small business owners are all paying a much higher uh, tax than the uber rich or the ultra rich rich in this country. I mean, that is a lot of voters. People will be reading that this week and they're probably feeling a little aggrieved. And I think that's unfortunate because it's not actually an accurate reflection of what the IRD report, uh, or for that matter the superior report published by the tax accountancy firm Oliver Shaw published last week. Um, those reports show that actually as people's income increases, uh, the tax that they pay increases as well, and that's across the board. Uh, the reason that people are saying that there's a lower tax rate uh, for some people is that the IRD in particular has counted paper increases in people's asset values and said, well, that's income, uh, and then divided it by the tax they pay and say, oh, well, your tax rate's lower. Mm. Now, I just make the point that if we were to take that seriously, uh, then we'd have to apply it to all taxpayers. So, for example, in 2021, uh, the median house price went up by $145,000. Now, if you were to be taxed on that paper income, as they suggest, uh, then every taxpayer in New Zealand would be, or every homeowner, sorry, would be paying $45,000 at a 33% rate. Uh, unfortunately for homeowners in 2022, the price went down 110000 So would they get a, a, a refund from the taxpayer? I don't know. Um, David Parker, has talked about imputed rents. If you pay and rent a house off someone else, you pay tax on your income first, then rent it. Someone who lives in their own house doesn't have to earn that income, pay tax and pay themselves rent. So there's an argument that people should pay tax on the imputed rent for living in their own house, and, and political <laughs> parties have seriously made that. So yeah. if you want to, to take the results of this report seriously, mm. then you would have to actually count all of the paper income that people theoretically have, but nobody's doing that, and that's why I don't think you should take those I, figures seriously it, either. It is a good point. Point. It is a good point, Chloe, and I know that you you want to pick up on that. Yeah, I do. Um, the first thing, actually, in the Superior Report, which David's referring to, is that they outlined themselves that there wasn't enough data to be actually imputing economic income or otherwise in this country. So actually what we have with the Treasury and the IRD report is a really useful database for a far more informed public debate in this country. But the other thing that I need to say is that what we're talking about here with these high-wealth individuals is 311 families in this country that hold 80 Five billion dollars in wealth, and, and over the period, over the period of the five years that was studied, they had an increase in that wealth of 4.3 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. That partially was actually realised wealth in terms of um, kind of asset exchanges and transactions to the tune of $1.4 billion in realised wealth. So even if we're to talk about taxing that uh, $1.4 billion, we're still talking about a greater tax take and therefore a far more effective uh, and fair one than we have at present. Well, a large part of what we're talking about here is sort of capital gains, which mm. um, is unrealised. Uh, Chloe, in terms of, you know, taxing that, taxing the wealthy, mm -hmm. um, how would you do that? 
So the Greens proposed in 2020 our wealth tax, which again, um, you know, all of the <laughs> political parties are currently working on our tax policy. So I'm going to be really clear, I'm not announcing a policy today, but sure. simply reflecting on what we campaigned on in 2020. And then we said, look, we know based on the data that we had at that point in time, and again, this data released this week gives us a far, far greater and richer database to draw from, and I hope that that will inform all parties' tax policies. But back in 2020, based on the data that we had, we knew that there were uh, approximately 6% of the population who had a net wealth individually of over a million dollars. So to play that out, what we were looking at is a 1% tax um, and a 1% wealth tax on those with a net wealth over a million dollars. In practice, that looks like if you're a couple with two and a half million dollars in net wealth, well, firstly, congratulations, you're in the top 6% of the country. And again, that's with all debt kind of um, taken away against that. Your individual net wealth is therefore approximately $1.25 million. So over that $1 million, it's $250,000, a 1% tax on that is two and a half thousand dollars. So for an extra tax bill of two and a half thousand dollars in the context of being an individual with 1.25 million dollars, we can end poverty in this country. We can pay for a guaranteed minimum income and reform of the ACC system. David? Uh, well, a couple of thoughts about that. I remember I debated a Green MP on this issue once and I said, well, what do you do for a retired couple that has worked and paid tax all their life? Um, they're asset rich and they now have to pay Chloe's asset tax. Uh, and this MP, and I suspect they regret it, they said, well, don't worry, you can get a reverse mortgage. Um, that's the practicality of it. But there's another point that Chloe is making in different ways, which is that if only the government had and spent more money, uh, then we'd get better public services. And I just make the argument that the government has never spent more money, it's never wasted more money, and right across the board we see the government spending more, it spends more as a percentage of GDP than Australia for example, uh, and we're just not getting the results. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Healthcare expenditure has gone from 18 billion to 28 billion. You know, that, that's what 60, 70 percent increase in the past five years, and that's after COVID's over. Mm. So the question people might ask is what are we getting for an extra 10 billion uh, in healthcare? Education's gone from 14 billion to 18 billion and yet there seem to be fewer kids going to school learning less because the government has got into a whole agenda of social engineering rather than checking if kids actually went to school. So I would make the case that you know if we want to focus on better outcomes, better opportunities, better health care, a more educated population, a better future for New Zealanders, yeah. uh, it may not be that just throwing more money at the problem is the solution. In fact I would argue we've tried that and the second point I'd make is that I want to bring, attitudes, it, back. Well, I want to bring it back David to the to um, the tax working group, and these are, you know, they, these are valid sort of broader points. But you know, Kiwis in particular, um, they sort of seem to be up and down on this CGT. Mm. At, um, around 54%, I think, could find the most recent poll in favour, and the rest either don't want it uh, or they don't know. You know, is is it? Are we? At, does it feel like this is uh, this work could set the scene for that discussion? Is, are we being sort of softened up here? Because it is a very difficult thing politically, isn't it, Chloe? You would know that. <laughs> I would, and I'd also say that the Greens campaigned on and had an historical election result with campaigning on a wealth tax. I do think and I do hope that this uh, research is going to result in a far more nuanced and a far more politically courageous discussion about tax settings in this country. And we've seen that outlined, I think, in some of the statements that particularly Minister for Revenue David Parker has set out. But I think we also need to acknowledge that we are an outlier internationally. Pretty much every developed country in the world has a form of capital gains tax. Then we've got a number of countries particularly Nordic countries who have a form of wealth tax. Mm. They have far higher productivity, they have far more prosperous countries and they invest more in their public services. So once again we come back to that core fact that I think it should be and I think many New Zealanders are resonating with the fact that it is fundamentally unfair that the wealthiest in this country are paying an effective tax rate half of the average New Zealander. Based on paper losses which you wouldn't seriously tax <laughs> and therefore it's a, it's a selective exercise and I talk about attitudes and values. What seems to be behind this is that someone somewhere has done too well, and Chloe gives you all the statistics, these people are so rich, if only we went and took their money off them, that would solve all our problems like end poverty. Well, I'm sorry, but it's not that simple. And if the attitudes and values are based
based on take, 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 rather than creating the conditions for people to invest, to be more innovative, to create higher paying, more interesting jobs, then we just aren't going to get there. And I hear Chloe saying, well, yes, but there's Nordic countries that have high taxes and they're wealthy. That's certainly true. But mm. they get the causation back to front. Those countries became wealthy when they actually had lower, flatter taxes than almost anywhere. You take Sweden. A hundred years they got out of poverty from 1860 by the 1970s. <laughs> well, it's true. Yep, yep. It's true. They, they grew extremely fast in a low-tax environment. Well, Since the 70s, they introduced high taxes and people like, and they've basically stagnated economically. Now, people like Chloe say, oh, we'll, well see, you can have high tax and be wealthy. That's true. But New Zealand is a country that needs to grow. We are in danger of losing first world status. Chloe, you disagree. <laughs> I just need to say, if we want to talk about things that are simple, you know, we frequently hear political rhetoric that education is a pathway out of poverty. Unfortunately, the, the reality tells us that parental income is the major determinant of educational success in this country. We also know, for example, here in Tamaki Makoto in Auckland, that $1.3 billion per year is lost in productivity by virtue of people sitting in traffic. Mm. We can make the requisite investment in infrastructure that makes all of our lives better, <coughs> increases our well-being, and makes all of us more productive and contributing and participatory members of our society. I want to throw a little fuel on the fire here, um, just as we sort of wrap up, and that is, as I was looking at the tax uh, report mm. and thinking about fairness in the system, the principles that were supposed to guide it, I wondered if we are so obsessed with having a fair tax system, shouldn't we be looking even higher, um, further up the chain, at multinational entities, for example, whether or not um, they shift their profits, you know, to tax havens and deprive governments of billions of dollars in revenue each year, legally, of course, mm -hmm. but isn't that the big fish? Well, I think the challenge for New Zealand is how do we get some of those countries to come here? And the question is, do you want to be a place that's hostile to investment, that looks at people who have done well and sends them a form from the IRD and goes through all their records? Uh, or do you want to be a country that says we're open for business, we want people to come here, we want to become wealthier, we want higher income, so ultimately we can have the health, the education and the infrastructure that a first world country would have. But don't we also want tax revenue from those companies for our country. Hmm, absolutely we do. And I think, again, we need to just reflect on some of the um, kind of international data and research here. We know that Aotearoa New Zealand was reflected in the Panama Papers and in the Paradise Papers as relatively um, a, a bit of a tax haven for some of those entities. We also know that, based on this research out this week, that uh, our trust structures in particular enable the kind of rabbit warrens of wealth and asset hoarding, which in turn results in this really unfair, fundamentally unfair tax system. And I think it's just also really important to reflect that the um, kind of methodology applied in the IRD and uh, in the Treasury research and uh, report is the equivalent to what we saw in the United States with uh, the Council of, I believe, Economic Advisors. Which got the same and result found, and is also wrong. Eh? They found fundamentally as well that uh, New Zealanders, the wealthiest New Zealanders in this country, are applying these same aggressive types of methods to hoarding that wealth as we see in the United States. And I don't think that that is a track that many New Zealanders would be comfortable with us continuing to go down. Final comment, David. Well, this is tall poppy syndrome and there's no future in that for New Zealand. We want to be a prosperous place, a first world country, a place that celebrates success and the last week or so of witch hunting driven by tall poppy syndrome ain't going to get us there. Lower, flatter taxes, more effective and efficient government service as well. Let's have a country that all New Zealanders can participate in. Let's have a country which funds properly and thoroughly our public infrastructure, which actually the wealthiest also rely on in order to to make their money. The system that we have at present privatises profit, socialises cost, and it's unfair. Well, I'm going to have to let you two agree to disagree on this one. Thank you so much for coming in. It's been fascinating to talk tax with you both. Cheers.